Good evening, everybody. Thank you for checking in and coming in after a long day, I'm sure, for many of you. My name is Ray Douglas. I'm a gangs and serious youth violence practitioner, I'm focusing around assistance. And as I mentioned, systemic youth violence, I'd like to welcome you all. Just going to give a few uh, minutes for people to populate the group and then we're going to go in. Um, so it's interesting, we've got people from all around the UK, uh, really looking forward to this. Um, I think it's a testament to the great work that the great people at, at Polgo are trying to do, reach out far and wide around different issues in relation to education and attainment. So we welcome you all. Uh, we're hoping to run through the presentation and then give some opportunity for some interaction, hopefully later on. Um, so feel free to drop some questions. Um, we'll try and open up the mics later if time permits. Um, some of you I recognise, um, others not. So no doubt we've got a lot of experience in the room especially those who work in the safeguarding and the schools space. Um, and this is, this is quite an, a, a defining moment for me because um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm sat in a hotel in um, Manchester and it's quite indicative of, of, of the current state of affairs because yesterday I was in East London um, delivering to some social workers and educators there today and working in Manchester um, and then tomorrow as well and then I'm off on, off on the travels again but a few days ago I was also in Wigan so what I'm seeing now is something that we we're not visionaries but we foretold what would happen the rise in youth violence but not just youth violence more recently school aged violence so Historically, you know, we'd be looking at 16 plus or 13 to 19 in terms of youth. Um, but it would a lot of the violence would be outside weekends, evenings. But what we're starting to see now is more violence in school uniform, if that makes sense, um, which is a tragedy, really. So today um, it's going to be a sharing platform in the sense of I'm going to share some of my ideas and some of the things that I've been working on over the last 15 years and change, um, specifically around gangs and systemic youth violence, but also revisit some of the drivers. Um, and it's always important that as practitioners, we reflexive. So reflexive from my understanding is not only how you impact your service users, the pupils, your young people, but also how the intervention impacts you. And, and when you reflect on yourself as a practitioner, how are you developing? What could you do better? What would you build on, et cetera? Um, so without further ado, I think we should, we're gonna crack on because I know it's seven o'clock on a, just gone seven o'clock on a, on a Tuesday evening. So for those who don't know, my name's Ray Douglas. Um, as I mentioned, the gangs and systemic youth violence practitioner. Yes, I am so sad that my, my Twitter handle is Gangology um because that's how long we've been doing this this work um and without forgetting I'd, as i said i'd love to give a shout out to the great people at apolgo who've set this up today who i'm working in partnership and are going above and beyond in getting these conversations out into the not just the education sector but into the public domain so shout out to the team at apolgo um so in terms of where we're at at the moment um I would like to um, really start with some of the the wins that we currently are, are experiencing. So, on average, um, as an as an intervention, we are working with anything from um, twenty thousand upwards a year in terms of pupils. And when I when I say that, um, that's not individual interventions. That is a variety of um, extended assemblies, for example, or target work. Um, likewise, um, working with young people over a longer period of time. Um, I'm quite proud of that number, to be honest, um, because I do remember when schools were reluctant to engage around this issue because there was really a kind of almost like a sentiment that, well, it's not really our issue or problem. 
So the fact now that schools are really, really drilling down deeper in to address some of this is really something I'm, I'm, I'm happy about. Um, so what you see there on the screen is, is almost the birth child of this work. So a little bit of a backstory. Um, about 14 years ago, maybe, um, I was invited over to Belfast, Northern Ireland, to go on a violence reduction program um, through UNESCO. So essentially it was around transformative work, how to work with people, young people specifically around violence reduction um, and conflict resolution. For me, it was a life-changing uh, visit trip to the extent that I brought home the flip chart notes of the lecturer because I was so inspired by what they were trying to do over there. So my background itself was around youth work, leaving school, I went straight into youth work of sorts. I did some bits at Bernardo's um, and different organizations. And then in my early, early 20s, I um, started developing my skills and some qualifications around adult education. But what, when I went over to Northern Ireland and saw the work that they were doing around transformative work, it really inspired me. So when I came back, as you can see there, I launched this program called Anti-Youth Violence. Now, I'm gonna show you how old this program is. If you look along the bottom of the screen, um, you're gonna see um, this word here at the bottom, YIPS, Y-I-P-S, Youth Inclusion Projects. They're no longer around, but that's how long we've been doing this work. Um, and what, what we were doing was we were going out and delivering directly to young people who those organizations or institutions felt were at risk. Um, it was very successful. It was, I believe it was groundbreaking back then. Um, and if I'm honest, we were really struggling to get the, some of the decision makers and policy makers on board because I think at that time they felt that youth violence was quote unquote, an issue for the black lads from the flats, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, and what we were saying was, look, what we start to see is the development of youth violence across the country in small pockets back then. But, you know, um, we believe it's going to escalate. Anyway, we kept our heads down, kept working, kept trying to change hearts and minds around this issue. Um, and we saw, you know, we start building up a a, a reputation around focusing on this work. But what would happen is back then we'd, we'd start to get calls from youth programs, schools, etc., and, and you know, head teachers call us. And this is, you're talking 13, 14 years ago. And they'd say, oh, Ray, um, we've got a gang problem. Can you come in? And we'd go over. And before, actually, before I go over, I'd say it's year nine, isn't it? And they would be like, how do you know? Well, clearly we know that, you know. That that year, that year that year group there year nine that rites of passage year that year where people are going through puberty is problematic for a lot of young people. So um, I turn up at the school and the, the head teacher would say, "Oh, thank you for coming, Ray. And we've got a serious gang problem. The, the kids are wearing multicolored shoelaces." And yeah, that that's the pause that I did as well. That pause there because what was happening was some of these organisations and schools and institutions were getting it wrong in short and identifying youth culture as gang culture which are two different things so lo and behold um i developed a, a program called gangology so gangology was although we were working with the young people on anti-youth violence what you can see there we felt there was a need to start working with practitioners to increase their cpd and then the floodgates opened so we started working with youth workers um, YAS workers, social workers, police, um, training them, training, you name it, um, to the extent in the Olympic year, um, all those years ago in London, we trained up a majority of the youth workers or those connected to the youth services in the new area, because what the last thing they wanted was for a young person to discharge a firearm in the middle of Westfield in the Olympic festival. Um, so that was essentially um, the backstory, and that now is, you know, at least probably over a thousand practitioners of a, a year are hearing our work or attending our training. So yesterday in East London, we had um, youth offender um, officers, 
um, social workers, early interventions, some academics, some enforcement around ASBOLs. So it's a, it's a great thing for me personally that a lot of these organisations and departments are now um, branching out and um, really plugging into some of the work that we're doing. So what I want to talk about today is what you see in front of you there is um, the, our latest programme. So just to backtrack, the first programme was anti-youth violence, the second programme was uh, gangology, and the third programme that you see in front of today is school age violence education, um, otherwise known as SAVE. And school age violence education does ex is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, what we, we're aiming to do is reduce the numbers of pupils getting involved in systemic youth violence. And in, un, in unfortunately, we are seeing already um, the second month into the, into the new year, the levels of violence amongst pupils. So school-aged violence education is essentially has different elements to it. So the first thing is, um, and this is what we're really pushing for, that the school adopts um, a universal model to the message. So whether there's only 2% of the school who are gang affiliated or, caught, or got that kind of DNA, if you will. We share the message of violence reduction from year seven to 11. Additionally, we have a primary school program called Teach Peace, which is a different version, but we, that's our early intervention. So Teach Peace is working within primary schools, whereas the SAFE program is predominantly working in secondary schools. I hope I'll be getting, catching my thread here. So. What that means is um, every pupil in the school gets the message, whether you're a high achiever or you're at risk. And that's important because that helps develop the culture of the school. Um, we want violence to look like, you know, not the cool thing. We want violence to be seen as well, not, not here, not in our school. Um, and, and that's key for us. So the first element is the extended assemblies. The second element is the parenting program. So what we do is we invite parents into the school and we work with them how do they can safeguard their children how, how they can say um, look for signs of violent potential violent behavior you know how can they stay abreast of the issues facing young people their young people specifically and what was interesting um, a couple of weeks ago i was in a secondary school um, who invited me in to speak to parents 29 parents in a classroom why were they there? Because previously, a few weeks earlier, there was a quadruple stabbing at the school. You heard me right, a quadruple stabbing. Four pupils got stabbed in one incident. So the main things the parents were asking were questions around contextual safeguarding, questions around how do we safeguard our young people, questions around um, how do we know it can't happen again, all these type of thing and what was interesting about that school it wasn't a um school that was been on the special special measures or anything and it was slap bang in the middle of three communities an affluent community um a very kind of um working class community um and a community that takes pupils from newly arrived um communities so um it was interesting to hear some of their challenges and concerns and it all reinforced the need for the work that we're doing so just to revisit, the first thing is extended assemblies, universal messaging or, or citizenship and enrichment day. So you can use that element, you know, the, the, the carousel model. So what I would do is we would bring our team in and we would work with um, each year group five sessions a day. I know most of you know the model. The difference is it's not five different providers. So when I bring my team, um, they specialize in different elements of addressing the drivers to youth violence. Okay, the next element is CPD, so it's very similar to what we're doing today. One of the things that needs to be done on a, on a, on a termly basis is to ensure that all staff, not just teaching staff, all staff have a certain level of CPD. So what we'll do is run inset programs. So those inset programs will either be twilights, after school, or on a, um, an inset day. And they're really interesting likewise because you and I both know that there's no teachers who went to get their QTS or their, their qualification, their PGCE. No teacher went to university and spent all those years to come and work around the gang's agenda. So therefore, what we do is, well, let's take some of that focus away for you and support you in how you can best identify those young people who need that support. 
So the, so for me, um, those three elements are key, but there's another element, and that element is schools identifying the pupils who are most at risk, and then we're working with them over a sustainable period. Because the enrichment days are really good, and the, uh, you know, the carousels and the extended assemblies, they're really, really good. But we can't just plug out and leave and go on to the next. What we want to do is start working. So schools have identified pupils most at risk. We work with them over a behaviour management programme. This programme is what we call minus violence. So minus violence is a behaviour management programme. One, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that my, one of my background, um, my background is around working within the secure state or you know as prison. So interventions that are longer and more sustainable is something that I'm really an advocate for, rather than just kind of quick wins and, um, you know, we, we move on to the next school. Why is it important? Because this notion of pro-social modelling, if pupils are seen and meeting regularly with people who um, understand the issue that they're going through, not to say that teachers don't, because they do, but teachers have got a lot on. There's a thing called teaching. There's a thing called behavior management in classroom. There's a thing called home uh, marking. There's a thing called targets. What we're saying to schools is why not support, work together and partner so we can really drill down and address that issue of, um, of that type of behavior. So um, I want to move on very quickly. Um, what you see there is something that um, that really captures the current state of affairs. Um, it might be something that most of you know about this specifically, this incident, but also where we are, because one of the things that, that really struck me recently, I was working in a primary school. And in that primary school, we were working with um, children, uh, I think they were, we were with year, um, year four and five. Um, and I just asked them randomly what music they listen to. And, you know, you had these little children with the oversized jumpers and these thick glasses and the girls with the little Alice bands. And, you know, you know the setting. I'm sure you can visualize it. And I kid you not, when, when we asked them some of the artists that they listened to, I was taken aback. Because we weren't talking like mainstream artists that are common, you know, commonly known or visible. They were mentioning a lot of underground artists, artists that aren't even in the public domain, really. You'd have to probably be from that culture to understand them. But what dawned upon me is the main reason is because a lot of them are listening to what their older siblings are listening to. So here you see um, a channel there in front of you, GRM Daily. Uh, GRM Daily, for those of you who don't know, is an independent channel on YouTube where artists who are primarily in the grime um, grime scene come up, upload a video or they themselves go into the shoot studio and um, to, they're speaking the vernacular to go and speak, right? So you see a young man here called Shoki. There's Shoki on the Wednesday. If you look in the bottom left of your screen, um, you can see the same young person bleeding out on the floor there. Um, I've blurred out the picture and over him is, is an officer and the officer's applying CPR. To the right is the, the same young person who made it to the paper that week, unfortunately, and was stabbed and, and died. But there's something else um, that, that you probably missed there. So if you look, go back to that second image of him lying on the floor, you look along the bottom of the image, you see his name typed in with the emojis. Because what you have there, as you know, um, is, is almost symbolic of what's happening. He is bleeding out on the floor, but instead of someone phoning the ambulance, they're filming him live. So he's live on Snapchat, bleeding out. So he's, he's dying on Snapchat before the ambulance gets there. So what happens is a whole generation of young people are seeing that, and we'll touch upon that a bit later, what that looks like even in further detail, but that is, it's a tragedy, but not just young people as in 16 plus, school age children, so when, I, when we use this case study in schools, all the young people know about it from whichever part of the country they're from. So I mentioned something to you um, a short while ago about me being a assistance practitioner. So I've worked in approximately 20 prisons, YOIs and children's security units across the country. 
Now, the obviously, children's security units is a nice way of saying children's prisons. So the youngest murderer that I've worked with is 13 years old, and the youngest rapist is 12. And prison is a mirror of what's happening on the streets. And I, I really, really want people to understand um, the critical nature of where we are now. So in some of the prisons that we work in, especially the YOYs, um, one prison in particular has 40, 40 individual gangs. 40. Okay. In another children's security I've worked in, they've recently banned trap music, and we'll talk about trap music shortly. So this is why I'm doing this webinar today with a poll going. This is why we, as, a, as an organization, a partnership, because we don't want to see any more young people dying. If you look at the silhouettes on that picture there, they're filling up at a horrendous rate. And every gender, every faith, every eye color, hair color is represented on that picture of young people who've lost their life. And more and more, we're seeing young people get younger and younger and younger. So that's why we're here today, because it's important that we reflect on our practices, but also we really want schools not to um, do and respond to violence as an afterthought or after a critical incident. We want it and need it to be bedded in their curriculum, embedded in their curriculum. So. Um, rather than a, a kind of, well, you know, and someone had an idea of oh, we need to, no, embedded, embedded just the way that the important issue of racism, radicalization, and right wing extremism is embedded. Gangs and serious youth violence and knife should be, has the same amount of focus because more young people are dying as a result of knife crime than are dying of a terror related attack. And they're, we're talking about life preservation. So it's all important. So the tipping point for me, and if anyone knows me or knows about me, my favorite book of all time is The Tipping Point. So The Tipping Point was a book written by Malcolm Gladwell when he talks about change and how society changes. Um, he quite often talks about food and fashion, but he also talks about crime. In The Tipping Point in terms of the UK, um, we have several incidents that changed the way that we looked at knife crime. So the, the obvious one from London was um, Damilola Taylor and some say Stephen Lawrence. Uh, Manchester, Jesse J. Um, Liverpool, interesting, was Rhys Jones, the young boy in Everton type who got shot, I think he was 11 years old. And that was a, a different type of tipping point because, um, one, because he was white, but also it made the whole country look at that, that part of the country and think, hold on, there's gangs there and they're white gangs and, you know, Norris Green and Croxteth and so on. Birmingham's tipping point um, well, obviously was the New Year's Eve shooting, the tragic shooting of the two girls. Um, but I believe there's a tipping point that we've had in the last two weeks um, around this issue of serious youth violence. And this is the one I'm referring to. The, the tragedy tragic death uh, murder of Jade and Moody only a couple of weeks ago, a um, few weeks ago. The age, the story, um, you know, the, the nature of how he was killed. Um, and what people are starting to, to realise is that, hold on a minute, we're talking about 13 and 14 year olds, whether they're in school or they're, they're in a pupil referral unit. And for me, that's, that's been a clear tipping point in the UK, that now we're starting to see this level of violence amongst these these young people. And what was interesting was if you looked on Instagram, I saw people who they themselves would disclose themselves or declare themselves as being, you know, from that kind of road life, street life. But even they were saying, look, there's got to be, this is beyond, you know, this is beyond even the, the code of the streets because of the nature of the, the way that he was murdered. But that 14 year old had friends and he had a peer group and he had family. And my question to you is how do you respond to something like that as an organization? How do schools respond to a pupil dying 
whether he was excluded at that time or not, or in a people referral unit, we still know other examples of pupils who have been stabbed. So what is gangology? So I'm sure you might be familiar with the book, The Seven Habits of, of Highly Successful People by Stephen Colvey. So Stephen Colvey talks about concern, whether they concerned your salary, concerned your relationships, your waistline, the planet, the ozone layer. He talks about concern. And as majority of us as humans, we have this big red concern because we can uh, against our influence. Um, he said a majority of us, that's how we navigate life. We allow our concern to eclipse our influence. However, what he says is that we have to get to this model. And the, the beautiful thing about schools is that they can be innovative, they can engage um, around this agenda a lot easier than other spaces. And that influence has to come from a leadership perspective. It has to come from a place where um, people who get it, and like I said earlier on in the, in, the, in the podcast, this isn't about the black lads from the flats. This is about young people up and down the country. I mentioned earlier on, I was in Wigan a few days ago. Wigan, okay? Not the most diverse town in the country. Great people, warm, welcoming. Problems around youth violence, problems around school age violence. So what we're starting to see now, even uh, recently I was working in a prison near Stoke, young white working class boys from places like Swindon who identify themselves as gangbangers. So what we're starting to see now is, is and people talk about gang um, and youth violence as a public health issue, but I I get it and I, and, I, and I definitely embrace that. And people talk about it as a disease, but me personally, I call it a forest fire. Reason being is now you start to see it take off. So almost every major city and cities around them are starting to adopt this culture. And when I mean adopt it in, a, in, a, in almost like an epidemic. So we can't have a conversation around youth violence without talking about this. This, uh, this driver you see, because a lot of the, if I want to know, if, so if I'm invited to a town and it's not one I'm familiar with and I want to know what's happening there around new violence, I just go online, like many people. I find out who the artists are, I find the language, the gangs, the, um, the as much historic beef as I can, conflict as I can. But what's interesting is um, you look at now this generation, so the average young person, the average pupil who's currently in school, by the time they reach 65, they'd have spent a total of four years with their thumbs on the screen. The average young person scrolls the distance of the Statue of Liberty every day. So they are plugged in, fully plugged in, and I don't believe there's any turning back from this. But, you know, we don't need to have the conversations about the effects of it. We know that a like and a retweet and a forward and a heart it secretes the hormone oxytocin that goes to, we know that, but there's the, there's the, today we're going to talk about violence. So what I want to talk about is the seven habits of resilient schools. And when I say resilient, I mean resilient around the issues of, of um, school age violence. So for me, the, the first habit is national standards. Um, I really believe that schools need to, across the country have national standards around this, meaning that every school should be adopting some program or have in their curriculum a program that deals with systemic youth violence. It's not, as I mentioned earlier, not an afterthought or not a, oh, somebody should. It's something that's bedded because what we're talking about is schools becoming peace informed. Peace informed is a, is a conversation I'm having with an organization called Peacemakers at the moment because a lot of young people have learned violence. They've learned violence through their home life. They've learned violence through music, through the streets. But who's teaching peace? And I'm not talking about some zeny type, let's levitate and put on some incense peace. I'm talking about radical peace, understanding the effects of conflict and understanding the effects of violence from a very young age. So the first habit I would say is national standards, which is cur currently not in place. 
The second thing now is what evidence-based practice, and I'm, I'm sure as practitioners you've heard this word, but evidence-based practice, practice means to me from a school context is that every school that are not just a hotspot, high-risk area, but they need to be able to map what gangs are outside that school based upon pulse codes. Understand, you, if you do that, you'll understand the conflict. And you know one of the, the one of the saddest things that that's happening at the moment, you have young pupils who are leaving primary school in transition year who are academically bright, some of them gifted and talented, some of them are really, you know, have potential to go on to greatness, but they can't choose the school that they want based upon the pulse code. How tragic is that? So what we're starting to see is violence, youth violence, gang violence affecting the education, op educational opportunities of some young people. So we know what guns are, we know what gangs are, but postcodes, this, this postcode issue, because what's, I mentioned earlier about um, contextual safeguarding and, and, and you can see it's very, um, you see a lot of work out there by Carlin Thurman around it and loads of providers talking about it, but one of the issues is where does that young person have to go through to get to school? What postcodes? Who's dropping them off? Who's picking them up? What bus do they catch? So we have to also, as schools, have to be outward facing because it doesn't start and end at the gate, unfortunately, anymore. It's happening outside the chicken cottage down the road. It's happening on the bus. It's happening online. And I think we have to be a bit more cuter about how we identify these conflicts. So habit number three is, is the, the criminal justice versus for public health issue. And a lot of debate has been happening by that, um, around that issue. Recently, you've seen the Violence Reduction Unit opening in the Mayor's Office in London, etc. But what we're talking about is when we talk about criminal justice issue, public health issues, is that we know the statistics of young people in secure state in prisons. But I want us to more adopt a not just a public health issue, a community-centred public health issue, meaning inviting communities into the school at appropriate times to talk and work with them so they're working in school so parents are working with the school not after there's an incident and and I, let's be clear because sometimes we often get a kind of this narrative that it's only these um young people from certain households and certain postcodes and certain estates that are being affected um the the last term of the last academic year i got a call in the middle of the night i believe it was late evening, it was from a, a practitioner that I knew who's a great practitioner, a great human. She, 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 she believes in young people. She works around the knife and serious youth violence agenda, um, youth offending, um, qualified counsellor, etc. And she gave me a call, and, and I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this with you, but she gave me a call that said, Ray, my 10 year old's been caught with a knife in primary school. Yeah, a professional, 10 year old caught with a knife in primary school. And they only found out she had a knife because when a, you know, other people went to her and said, so and so's got a knife, she said, I've got a knife too. So what happened? You got two 10 year old girls in primary school with knives. And it was tragic because this parent, not only she's really, um, you know, she's really engaged with her own children, but she believes in young people and supports this. So let's be very clear here. We are no longer talking about the stereotypical kids from the estate. This is a forest fire and we need as practitioners to join together and especially as educators to see how we can work around this agenda and reduce the number of young people dying. So here in front of you there, um, this is the, um, for me, this is an ideal model. It comes out of the um, violenceepidemic.org. So if you look to the left of the screen, one of the first places it starts with is, is schools. Everything, this is the ecosystem, and this is how really it's supposed to work. I don't know if you've ever watched the Truman Show, but it's almost like the Truman Show. Everything's in place. Now we're far away from this. It's getting better, but you can see schools are at the center of it. Create yourself and have healthy learning environments. Now, um, today's um, Internet Safety Day, and I've been doing some great work with the people at Apogo. And one of the things we were talking about in recent one of the vlogs recently was the fact that um, 
the reduction in youth spaces. So if you think about it, three to 400 million, depends which report you read, has been removed from youth services in this country. Not only that, north of a thousand youth centres have closed and thousands and thousands of youth workers have lost their jobs, took in voluntary redundancy, et cetera, because of the cuts. So there's very few safe spaces left for young people to discuss, very few safe spaces left for young people to heal, very few safe spaces left for young people to have dialogue. And if you look at that model in front of you, um, whether it be the, the you know the academic centres or the faith institutions, every institution, all of us have a role to play. At the centre of it, obviously, is the community, but schools are an integral part of this, and it can't be um, you know it can't be understated how important it is, especially with the decline of youth services across this country. So the twenty-year warning. If you read the, a certain newspaper twenty years ago, you know they would say stuff like. You know, the Yardies are coming and they've got gold teeth and lock up your daughters and, you know, that whole narrative, that stereotypical narrative. But we know this is no longer, this is not true. We knew it weren't true then, but now more than ever, we're starting to see um, this level of violence affecting all communities, white, Asian, Arab, Afro-Caribbean, African. And we don't need another warning. Um, and I, you know, I go, I go as far as to say we don't need another report. You know, we know what needs to be done, and partnering with schools is one of the things that needs to be done. Um, and this is why now we're looking forward to when we're looking forward, looking forward into the future, because we have to roll our sleeves up. So the habit number four, though, is issue and target based. So when I say issue and target based, is um, let's talk about, um, like today, I'm in Manchester, as I mentioned, it's Hate Crime Awareness Week. Now, I've worked with approximately maybe 140 young people throughout the day today, and only out the two of them, could, only two of them could explain what Brexit was. Out of the 140 young people, or even get close to it. And what's interesting is I, I use this, I use an example of Brexit as, as I'm very much like um, early intervention. So science has told us that when two parents are arguing in front of a toddler, it can affect the central nervous system of that toddler. Likewise, when these young people and pupils are seeing adults arguing over Brexit, it's almost affecting them like, uh, you know, these, these elders or these old people are just arguing over something. But the importance of it is what? The fallout from it will be, if, there's a, if there is austerity, if there is a recession, what will happen? Violence increases in austerity, history tells us that. But also xenophobia, racism, and all the other things that come, and hate crime. So great thing I was in an educational space today, which still can create those safe spaces for dialogue. So issue and target based is so important. So very quickly, I'm going to give you a 60 second task right and it's it's a friday afternoon at 4 p.m i want to i want to think through this and probably we might set up some time after for people to feedback it's friday afternoon at 4 p.m you get a polite email from the head to deliver a one-hour assembly on monday morning at 08 30 hours to 400 year 10 and 11 pupils my question to you, the practitioners who've, who've dialed in today, what resources will you use? What issues will you discuss? How will you maintain their concentration for one hour and retention? What will be your call to action? So your call to action could be anything ranging from how to deal with disclosures or if young people want to get involved. And as and by the way, your chair of governors, um, your local MP and Ofsted will be present. So no pressure there then. So, um, do we have are we fit for purpose that's my question because saying we need to go in schools is one thing but how do we make it relevant how do we make those young people leave that assembly that classroom that after school program inspired build resilience and the the, the, the when i talk about building resilience i'm talking like you know if you, you all know the film black panther there's a part in it when he gets the kingship and his sister build and um, makes a suit for him and she says it, it, it def, you know, deflects negative energy and that kind of you know, building resilience amongst young people because we talk about resilience all the time. But are we fit for purpose uh, to, so we can partner with schools and have impact? And that's, what, um, that's the challenge really. 
for both schools and practitioners. I mentioned earlier transformation, not diversion. Yes, five-a-side football is always going to be good. Pool and table tennis is always going to be good. But we're in an era where we need transformation. We need programs that you can measure distance traveled so we can show how people have improved, how their behaviors improved, and how we measure it and and and, and the impact that we have on the, on on our um, on them through programs. I can't talk about gangs and serious violence without talking about media and, and what we call murder media. You know, if any of you see my work, I'm, I'm, I've been talking about murder media for the best part of 10 years. Um, the games and the effect it has. You know, we don't. I don't want to get into Fortnite on this webinar, but you know, a teacher said to me recently, they know when a new schools. And no one a new games come out because they can see how tired the pupils are the morning after because they've been on it all night. Interesting. The films, yeah, the constant kind of single narrative films and, and the music. And I, I you know, I have to I have to highlight, I'm not usually a person who highlights individuals, but you what you see in front of you there is a is a 61-year-old Tim Westwood, 61 private school educated, son of a bishop, his father was a bishop, week in, week out, having um, young vulnerable men and young people, sorry, some of them school-aged in his studio, and we don't need to say that they're not spitting about global warming. Um, but what's also sad about that picture individually is, is three of those young men have died, um, and at the end of the month, I'm sure it's Tim Westwood who gets the the remittance from YouTube for the views. So what we have now, and, and, and I want you to remember where you heard this word ver first, the verse, the, the word called child violence exploitation, because that's what you're seeing now, child violence exploitation. And I was, I was training up in um, Bolton recently and, and a social worker turned to me and he's a kind of like old school, been around many, many years. He turned to me and he said, you know what that picture reminds me of, right? It reminds me of Jimmy Savile. So we're up against it, you know, we're up against a narrative out there which is, is is entrenched in stereotypes, entrenched in exploitation, entrenched in um, violence. But And some people don't want to hear this, but what you see in front of you there, that is the new pop music. That is the new take that. Because pop music just means popular music and by, based upon streams and views. And my, as I always say to people, the 20 plus prisons that I've worked in, I've never heard Adele or Justin Bieber coming out of a cell. But now also what you're starting to see is the gentrification of violence. So I'm sure many of you remember where North Face, North Face was the coat worn by the deputy head, um, you know, who liked a bit of mountaineering on the weekend. Now, North Face is the staple jacket, the staple three, four hundred pound jacket for most pupils. But recently, if you saw what Puma did, Puma had a real interesting um, launch of a, pro, um, a product line called House of Hustle, where that you would work, for, say, for example, you work for a design agency or you worked somewhere in a nice kind of, you know, bougie part of, of, of a major city. Um, you you'd get this through the post and you got a card that says turn on your, this phone at seven o'clock and then you'll be directed to a secret party launch of our house of hustle range and as you can see in front of you there the picture there's the phone which is obviously the trap phone and there's the card fake money and there's the invite and if you look across the screen here they designed can you believe it they designed the party like a crack house with the mattresses and then at the end the the mandatory mcs are invited um to, to to spit whilst they were giving out the canapes and wine so you see now the gentrification of violence which is tragic um habit number seven conflict revolution peace building so what's why i mentioned that puma scenario is because the corporates now are getting the attention of the young people to wear their clothes through the music so all those school children you're seeing wearing those designer labels it's because those corporate organizations have sponsored a lot of those artists so but now let me be very clear here 95 point 
probably more percent of young people pupils aren't involved in gang violence 99 percent, i would argue however 99 percent of them are aware of the culture because the culture the intersectionality of the culture the dress the music the language is so close so when i was up north recently they were dressing exactly like the young people in bradford in uh, in manchester in london in birmingham that intersectionality is so close and at the heart of that is violence so it's about leadership you probably can see a great guy there on the screen sorry about that um it's about leadership it's about moving beyond projects and building movements and schools becoming peace hubs if that makes sense community spaces starting talking about peace again started building resilience starting having those honest conversations that we haven't had for a long time because it's getting worse and i feel if a lot of us are getting compassion fatigue and getting desensitized to the fact now that did re did we really just lose a 14 year old to that just got ran over and stabbed seven times yes we did and you know we have a history we have a history of young children dying in this country but also one of the things, and I know all teachers do this, and they do it well, um, they remind a lot of them, you know, they remind pupils that you've got a genius. And that's all we're saying. You have a genius and you have dreams. All these things, whatever the safeguarding issues, these will detract you from your dreams and your genius. There you have the picture of, of Damilola there. And I don't need to, 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 because most of you know the story, so we don't need to vi revisit that. But you know, the last images in, of him, him having dreams of being a doctor with his friend who went on to become, as you know, John Boyega in, in Star Wars. But what's the point I'm making is that safeguard, them safeguarding themselves from violence, from criminal behavior and so on. For me, it's about life preservation, but we're also seeing their, their dreams being extinguished by this violent culture, you know, we talk about, you know, all last year, I was, and this is a true story. And sometimes when I say these things, people just think I'm making it up. I was, in, I was invited to a birthday party recently for a one-year-old child who was a relative of a relative. So I've always wanted to know why we go to one-year-old birthdays because the one-year-old doesn't know it's their birthday. But anyway, that's another conversation. Um, they had an entertainer there. And the entertainer was um, doing different things, the, the normal mandatory, you know, balloons and the games. And then all of a sudden, next up children, um, we've got musical chairs. So we all love musical chairs. I know everyone in the room loves music. Everyone's, everyone loves musical chairs growing up. What do you think the song was that they would do musical chairs to? Man's Not Hot, four-year-olds. And I just sat back and watched this which is, yeah, it's a parody and it's a spoof and so on, but it's full of violence and it's full of misogyny. And to see it was like, is this really happening? At a kiddie's birthday party, jelly and ice cream, four-year-olds, five, six, seven upwards, playing musical chairs to Man's Not Heart. But... Let's be honest, some people don't want to, um, don't want to address this. And, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of the head teachers that I work with are really, really passionate about making a difference and teachers and are really switched on um, when it comes to addressing violence in school. Some schools are still saying, I'm going to be honest, some schools are saying, well, it's not, we don't have that problem here. So let's look at the statistics. In the last four years, um, I think it lasts three or four years. Um, I think approximately 300 knives with a specific area within 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 the UK. No need to mention it. 300 knives taken off pupils. So how many do you think weren't found? And I get it now. Schools are introducing knife arches, but guess what? Young people are, are very very smart. They'll hide it in the bushes down the road. It's simple. So we have to, we can as a society we can no longer keep our head in, our buried in the sand. So what are our ideas? You know, where's our loyalty? Our loyalty is to, is to the young people. Um, and we should never be afraid of innovation. That's why I, I love the people here at Apogo because they're coming from a total different angle when it comes to working with schools. 
you know we're making it accessible for people to to access knowledge weekly daily but also you know the, the, the belief that there has to be some innovation when it comes to education um, and partnering with schools is key with that so it's not, yes numeracy literacy and all the other subjects are important but where do we teach them the other things and continue to teach them where does our energy go because we, yeah we, we, we all live in a world of targets and milestones and outputs and outcomes and key performance indicators and grades um, but also sometimes about innovation. So if you look at people say, oh, as there's 24 hours now, as there has always been 24 hours, it's just they didn't open their doors to the public. And what I'm saying is that innovation is that sometimes we have to step back and think, well, how can we get more people? How can we bring more people on board when it comes to violence reduction? How do we innovate? Because, you know, I'm going to be really honest with you. Football on the AstroTurf is not cutting it in 2019. And, you know, when I work, I've worked in, the, I managed the gangs unit in prison, the most violent gangs unit in the country. I've managed the team in there. And, you know, you're talking about young men who will look at you and say, look, no disrespect. We love what you're doing. But, you know, I'm coming back here. Only a couple of years before those same young people were in school. So what are the messages? And I think we need to kind of no, no sugarcoat in the message. We need to be very clear about what we're saying here because this is about life preservation. Social media, we don't have a conversation about that. But we do have to have a conversation about social justice. And social justice is um, at the heart of all this work. Joint enterprise, so now We've had a, you hear the conversations about joint enterprise, um, young people being sentenced to lungs because they were there at the time of the fight. And most of you remember when we were at school and there'd be a fight and people gather at the, the green down the bottom of the road. But now that happens, if knives are getting pulled out, you, you're gonna have pupils going to prison potentially. I'm gonna wrap it up there because I'm really conscious of time. Um, so thank you for those who um, stayed in, 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 in for the, went a little bit over. I hope it was a snapshot um, of what, what needs to be done. Um, I think we may, uh, I'll check in with one of the admins who's doing all the hard work. Um, if we want to continue, if people would like to have a conversation, then we can maybe continue that um, another day. I do think um, this is the start of something great. I know we'll see a lot of you in the group there who are experienced practitioners and it'd be interesting to keep the conversation going. Make sure that you um, keep in touch and download the Apolgo app. Um, I would suggest that if, you, if you'd like to keep this conversation going, drop me an email um, you can either drop myself an email or a pogo and all the details are there with your registration. Um, but yeah, the Apolgo app is something that if you haven't downloaded already, then please, please do so. There's tons and tons of content on there and quality content and it's, and it's consistent. Um, but like I'd say, I'm going to jump off. Um, I wish you all peace and blessings and hopefully we can work together in the future and likewise I um, stay in touch and check in you know if there's anything that you want to add um, you've got our emails and our details and maybe our paths will cross in due course peace have a great week